and Edmund Malinowski. To me, Edmund Malinowski is a silent hero of the Warsaw Uprising. All of his life, he cultivated his love for the fatherland. He was a very open-minded person. He would always say, you don't need to hear to fight the enemy. It was him who taught the chosen students of the Institute the practical side of handling the weapons. Ideologically, they were prepared for underground fighting, working under conspiration, as well as for partisan warfare. The soldiers of the Deaf Platoon were exceptionally capable and unusually fit. Those of the Deaf Platoon possessed exceptional instincts. The fact that those people did not hear bomb explosions showcases their courage that much more. In the history of World War II, there was no other unit like it. Only after 1989, one could write anything about that topic. The Anthill Association learned about the history of Edmund Malinowski in 2021. And that happened thanks to our fieldwork in the past lands of Polish Commonwealth, in the present-day Western Ukraine, where we carry out restoration activities in the civil cemetery in Kivertsi, where we revive gravestones, take care of this space, and cultivate the memory of the ones buried there. Among other things, an old historic Polish cemetery is located within our parish. Since the beginning of me being here on this parish with my parishioners, we take care of this cemetery, we tidy up, organize the space and look for more Polish gravestones. One of the gravestones which underwent conservation works was the one that belonged to Heronim Malinowski. While working on the gravestone, we conducted research into Malinowski family ancestry. Malinowski family lived in the Volhynia region from the end of the 17th century. A Polish heraldist, the author of A Roll of Arms, Kasper Nisiecki, singled out two branches of the Malinowski family. One identified with the Pobog coat of arms, the other identified with Sleporon coat of arms. They inhabited a few places like Szpaniv, Dzidowice, Żabinia. In those places they possessed properties. Pobog family prided themselves for a famous builder of the Transandine Railway. However, the part of the family living in Żabinia gave the world the hero of our film, Edmund Malinowski, born on 8 of November of 1898 in Kivertsi. Kivertsi is a city which grew around a railway station, attracting numerous railwaymen's and railway staff's families. It was the railway where Edmund Malinowski's father worked. Edmund, as a child, went to an underground school in Kivertsi, where he received his education in Polish language. Because had he attended a state school, you could say it was a four-year Russian language school, as it was under Russian occupation. Later, Malinowski continued his education in Lutsk Middle School, the outbreak of World War I forces Malinowski family to move. They move to Uman. Last two years before high school finals, Malinowski attends underground classes in Polish history and literature. He simultaneously studies in a Russian school. By the end of World War I, when the petitioner countries started to focus on the Polish case, efforts have been undertaken to create Polish military units. In 1917, after high school finals, Edmund Malinowski volunteered to enroll to one of those units. However, in order to join a Polish unit, one had to first join the Russian army. He was even promised by a Russian officer, 
that he will be ascribed to the first Polish corpus in Russia under the command of General Józef Dalbor Musnicki. Unfortunately, the promise was illusory and Malinowski was sent to the front, where he took part in skirmishes as a part of 305th Lukiv Infantry Regiment. For his bravery, Edmund Malinowski was awarded with the 4th Class Cross of St. George. In addition to his decoration, he graduated from a military academy, attaining the rank of an ensign. He took part in skirmishes with Bolsheviks, who after the outbreak of revolution in Russia, started sabotage actions against the Russian Empire Army. As a result of those events, many soldiers defected from their mother units, which resulted in skirmishes. Many of them became captives to the Bolsheviks. Edmund thrice found himself in a situation where he was at the mercy of revolutionists, however. Each time he was able to escape. Despite many efforts, he didn't manage to join a Polish unit. Even after making a connection with one of the Polish military committees in Rostov-on-Don, he changed his course to Volhynia. Over there, he made contact with the Polish military organization, taking part in skirmishes alongside Ukrainian soldiers against Bolsheviks. A serious illness was the reason that only at the beginning of 1919 he was able to come back to Kivertsi. At the time, restored and independent Polish Republic was facing Soviet invasion. Edmund Malinowski again gladly volunteers to fight in the restored Polish army. He's drafted to second vehicle column in Warsaw Armoured Motorized Platoon. While fighting in this platoon, he took part in the Lviv defense, fought in Volhynia. He also took part in Kiev offensive. On the outskirts of Zhytomyr, his armoured vehicle was damaged by Bolshevik artillery strike. Luckily, the crew managed to survive. When the Treaty of Riga was signed in March of 1921, Edmund Malinowski still deemed it appropriate to defend the Polish Republic's borders and went to Upper Silesia, where he joined the efforts of the Third Silesian Uprising. In this uprising, he served as a messenger, driving a Harley-Davidson motorcycle. A photo of Edmund is preserved to this day, which is showcased in the Museum of Silesian Uprisings. When the Silesian Uprising ended, Edmund Malinowski, as a military member, was sent to Warsaw to serve there in the state police. He was stationed on Hosa Street. Soon after those events concluded, he came back to Volhynia, where for a short time he worked in a tax office in Rivna. This June, in the year 2023, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of our parish of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Christ, here in Kivatsi, which was started in 1923. I think Edmund Malinowski surely experienced all the events which, at that time, were happening here in our parish. Around that time, he finished a teaching course and from the end of 1921 started working as a teacher and a headmaster of common schools in the Lutsk region. He participated in the activities of Common Schools Polish Teachers' Union. For several months, he taught in six facilities. Luck has it, a photo from Rudnia was preserved to this day, depicting Edmund Malinowski with the teachers of this school. When teaching in Sokil, as a reserve officer, he decided to nostrify the rank of sergeant. He enrolled to a six-month course for soldiers in Volodymyr Volinsky, which he passed, and became a full-fledged sergeant. At the beginning of 1931, he moved from Kivatsi to Warsaw. For a couple of months, he was employed as the director of Jordan Park in the capital, later on becoming a housemaster in a youth reformatory by the Jagielonska Street. By the end of that year, he took a position as a headmaster and a teacher in the Deaf and Blind Institute by the Three Crosses Square, where he learned to use sign language. At the time, 
when he settled down a little and met his future wife, Maria Gadzinska, whom he married in 1933. In 1935, he finished a six-month child social care course called Przechnitsa. Until 1938, he lived by Kshiazenca Street in Warsaw. Later, he was offered an apartment in the so-called Gardener's House, on the grounds of the Deaf Institute. The Deaf Institute was started by a priest, Jakub Falkowski, in Warsaw in 1817. Those buildings standing to this day were funded by mostly public collections, which was an unbelievable deed. In 1842, a school for the blind was started. The name later was changed to the Deaf and Blind Institute and operated under many different governing bodies. At a certain time, it was under Russian governance during partitions. In the Second Polish Republic, it flourished. On the 1st of September 1939, World War II has broken out. Edmund Malinowski again was drafted to the army, where he as a sergeant was heading a platoon in the commander-in-chief's, the vehicle column. On 20th of September, he was imprisoned by the Germans and moved to a temporary German camp in Terraspol by the Bug River. In the January of 1940, he managed to escape and return to Warsaw. Upon returning to the capital, he had to learn to live in a new reality of German occupation. He was actively working under conspiration. He was then working as a headmaster and a teacher in the Deaf and Blind Institute at Three Crosses Square. In 1940, he joined the Union of Armed Struggle, later renamed to the Home Army. The Deaf Institute and its employees, from the very start, were participating in conspiration efforts. First person to get involved in those actions was a PE teacher, Wiesław Jablonski, who took an alias Lush Chich. It was him, a sub-lieutenant and officer, who started forming a conspiration movement. In the beginning, it was a couple of people. Later, it grew to 20. Many of the volunteers wanting to join in were the students of the institute. Edmund Malinowski had military experience. He supposedly taught the chosen students of the institute the practical side of handling the weapons. In his apartment in the gardener's house on the Deaf Institute's grounds, he would organize theoretical military trainings. Over there, he would also take pledges from newly joined Home Army members. People would come in threes under the guise of private tutoring sessions under the guise of homework. One could organize such training sessions. Those were the people with a thorough patriotic education. It was the gift of priest Falkowski's Deaf Institute. They were instilled with love to the fatherland, to Poland, so they were prepared ideologically. They were prepared for underground fighting, working under conspiration, as well as for partisan warfare. After three years of training under Edmund Malinowski, they were ready for armed struggle. The partisans from other units during the Warsaw Uprising noticed that the deaf platoon soldiers were really capable and exceptionally fit. Not only conspiration work was important, the emphasis was also put on the general fitness. That was to be put to use in the fight against the invaders. What did the deaf do as conspiracy efforts until the uprising? Because deaf people wore special signs on their sleeves, a band with Topshtu Ma written on it, which meant deaf. German patrols and the military police would treat those people in a different manner. They were never stopped by German soldiers because the German soldiers would never even dream them to be the soldiers of home army. They were deeply mistaken because those sworn members acting in the structures of the home army were exceptional couriers and great messengers who delivered documents, orders, as well as guns. Also, in the three years of occupation, their role since they got involved in July of 1941 was indeed substantial. 
Along comes the 1st of August, 5 p.m. The W hour has struck. Now, since the uprising has started, the 1107th Def Platoon was formed, whose commander was Sergeant Edmund Malinowski. The entire Def Platoon consisted of around 50 people, out of whom 30 were actually deaf. On 9th of August, the Deaf Platoon was divided into two groups. First, a 10-member strong, which was more combat-focused, and the other in a support role consisting of the rest of the members. Sub-Lieutenant Jabłonski, in his memoirs, described the events as, From this moment on, they were on guard duty on designated outposts. Due to the scarcity of weapons, they received rifles each time before assuming their outposts. They were exceptionally conscientious. Their readiness and discipline could be presented as model for other soldiers of the home army. In the uprising, the Def Platoon was ascribed to Milosh Battalion, to Raider Company. The perimeter of their actions was the city centre on the Three Crosses Square, those were the whereabouts. A difficult terrain, I might add, because it was the so-called German district. I might add that here my father also joined the uprising. He did not take part in the fighting on the barricades. He was one of the ones looking for pigeon fanciers on top of the rooftops. That meant looking for German snipers. He also served in the guard company. Halina Javorska lived with my father Marian, who escaped from Volhynia UIA Terror, Ukrainian Insurgency Army. She went with my father to the Three Crosses Square, and she was taken in by Edmund to his unit, and she served as a messenger. Under Edmund Malinowski's command, the Def Platoon actively took part in many military actions like taking of Soldatenheim, the military center, which was located in Queen Jadwiga Gymnasium. Additionally, they took Imker building and took part in many skirmishes with Germans on guard duty. 
For his actions, Edmund was promoted to sub-lieutenant and awarded with the Cross of Valour. Several such stories have become legendary. Such a story was told by other insurgents. When there was a bombing and the platoon has scattered, part of able-bodied people ran in one direction, while the deaf led by instinct. Let's remember a deaf person does not hear, but other senses are extremely sharp. People would say that the deaf platoon members had that exceptional instinct. When the group of healthy soldiers ran, all of them died. All the deaf who ran in the opposite direction, all of them survived. It was remarkable. The handicap they had, in this case, turned out to be, and I wouldn't like to over that word, but a certain gift. In this environment, it was their gift that let them remain internally calm in the face of circumstances which would make the most collected people with healthy hearing unnerved. The result of the Warsaw Uprising for the deaf platoon was incredible. All of them, handicapped people that today are counted, up to 34 people, survived the uprising. It was an unbelievable feat. On the 2nd of October, the end of the uprising, surrender. Most people from the deaf platoon blend into civilian population and escape to Pruskov and further. Nine of the deaf platoon insurgents, led by Mundek, Edmund Malinowski, were held captive by the Germans and were transported to San Bostel camp. And then the German officers said, how did you fight us? You were insurgents and handicapped at the same time. It was unbelievable. In the history of the Second World War, there was no other such unit with handicapped people, who, one could say, were fully capable, 100% on the front lines during the uprising fighting.
Edmund Malinowski was in German captivity until the moment the POV camp was liberated by the English army. Later, he spent a brief moment in a temporary camp in Oberlangen. In 1945, Edmund Malinowski came back to Poland and settled by the coast where he rented an apartment. By the end of the same year, he took on the management of a horticultural farm in Dansk Oliva by Opatska 8th Street, where he and his wife cultivated flowers and vegetables. After his return from captivity, Edmund had a mess tin, a fork and a folded spoon. And I often witnessed when his wife Maria would serve dinner, Edmund would put the dish aside and would say, please serve the soup in the tin mess. And more often than not, he would eat from that tin mess. Between 1945 and 1954, Edmund Malinowski served as the administrator of the cemetery in Gdansk Oliva at Opatska Street. After reaching the retirement age in 1964, he went for a well-deserved rest from the professional life. He passed away at 5th of June in 1980 at the retirement home in Gdynia Redlow. His resting place is in the Gdynia Vitamino Cemetery. He was a very open-minded and sociable person. We had many things in common, but I need to confess, he would avoid talking war. Nor would he discuss captivity. Not only him, but also his battle brothers. They wouldn't talk about it too. I tried again after a few years to squeeze something out of him. To be frank, he really did not want to. I think it was because it was the reign of communism. Both my father and his brother, Piotr or Edmund maybe, were afraid of saying too much. And I would, so to speak, accidentally spill the beans and then they could consequently get into trouble. Many deaf insurgents, similar to other able-bodied soldiers, were strongly disappointed with the new reality, which they found themselves in Warsaw after World War II. Edmund and his subordinates inspire admiration, however unknown their story is. For many years, the memory or commemoration of the deaf platoon fighting with such devotion and such bravery in the Warsaw Uprising was not commemorated. Just as the whole uprising at the times of Polish People's Republic. Hardly any remembrance, I'm talking about awareness from the government's side, not what people would do to remember the uprising and the insurgents. The same applied to the deaf platoon and their commander. In 2015, a big stone was placed on the grounds of the Deaf Institute. 
a large monument with 34 names of all the deaf soldiers inscribed into it who participated in the uprising. Some of them did not fight in the deaf platoon, but were members of different formations, gathered here in one place. We can see their names on a grand monument which is worth visiting while being on the Three Crosses Square. As for the memory of Edmund Malinowski, by the time of the breakthrough, only brief mentions of the deaf platoon were published until 1989. Only after 1989, one could write anything about that topic. Among others, the The Deaf and Blind Institute took interest in the cause and started gathering information. The care of Edmund's grave was carried out by members of his family. However, when they too passed away, the grave became threatened with demolition as Mieczysław accidentally found out. I was shocked about it. Luckily, I had a friend who lived in Gdansk, Adam Hlebowicz, who I wrote to about this situation. And Adam told me, I will gladly take care of that. Mieczysław Malinowski once called me the person I met in relation to Volhynia and helping Catholic Church in the East. He asked for help in finding the gravestone of his uncle in the Witomin Cemetery in Gdynia. I went there and the search took some time. I managed to find it on the brink of the big cemetery that spreads over the hills. I managed to get to this gravestone. We jointly designed the gravestone. This gravestone today looks impressive, with that white andred flag with the kotwica, the anchor. When the gravestone was placed in the Dinya Vitamino Cemetery, as I said, still I couldn't go there, and it crossed my mind that someone has to take care of that grave. By accident, I stumbled upon a school for children with hearing impairment in Gdynia. 
I wrote a letter to this school, which wrote back almost immediately with an answer and great eagerness to take care of this grave site. In 2014, a letter addressed to our school has arrived. It told the story of Edmund Malinowski. I consulted it with our teachers, parents, students, and collectively we decided to undertake this task. Pan Edmund Malinowski is dla mnie. To me, Edmund Malinowski is a silent hero of the Warsaw Uprising. He would always say, you don't need to hear to fight the enemy. I try to repeat the same to my students who I teach history in the school for children with hearing impairment in Gdynia. Every year we would visit his grave with our colleagues. We light the candles, bring flowers, talk about him and tidy up his grave. For them, it's a tangible history lesson in patriotism. I did it, not only because of my great respect for a real hero, and not only to cultivate his remembrance, but I also kept in my mind all the benefits for our students stemming from those actions. Namely, a practical history lesson and formation of civic attitudes and increased integration of hearing and handicapped children in the shared care of the gravesite. Also, building up self-esteem of hearing impaired children. That was also my goal. Every year they place flowers and light candles on the grave, and for a time I kept in touch. But later on it was enough to just go to a website and see the youth placing flowers, as it was all depicted online. I thought I have found suitable caretakers for Edmund's grave. The history of deaf insurgents is also kept alive in Karlish, in an education institution bearing the name of the Home Army's Deaf Platoon. Our institution is devoted to children and youngsters with hearing impairment. We have been operating in Kalisz since 1996. By the decision of the whole community of the institution, the parents, students, teachers and workers of the institution, we made a decision to take the deaf platoon under our patronage. It was the closest to the specificity of our school and the closest to the hearts of our students. Every year, we celebrate the day of our patron and remember all the ones who fought in the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. Each year we also celebrate on the last week of September the day of our patron, and it's connected to the Hearing Impaired's Day, as well as with the last days of the Warsaw Uprising. As part of preparation for naming of the school, our students with the teachers travelled to Warsaw numerous times. We visited the Museum of Warsaw Uprising, where the guides were the deaf heroes of the uprising. We visited the Museum of Warsaw, we were at the Deaf Institute and the Polish Deaf Association in Warsaw. Those connections with amazing people allowed us to gather numerous keepsakes connected to the deaf platoon of HA. Thanks to their generosity, today our institution has a remembrance room, which stores photos, IDs and other types of documents connected with the members of the deaf platoon of HA. On 23rd May of 2012, a ceremony of naming our school was held. 
lecz zanim to nastąpiło. But before it happened, we had been preparing for this process for over a year. As a result of our actions before the naming ceremony, different crafts were prepared by our students. Especially close to our hearts is a comic story drawn by Piotr Kwieczynski, which remains in our institution to this day. We can still see it in the paper version. I think it's an unbelievable history lesson which can involve children and teens alike and is presented in an accessible way for students. I think it sets a great direction and other schools in Poland should consider that it's worth having its own patron in the school name. The memory of these heroic deeds reaches beyond the borders of Poland. Edmund Malinowski has also been honored on the territories of Ukraine in Volhynia, in Kivertsi. His family hometown at the local history museum, a bust monument was placed, a magnificent face of Edmund Malinowski signed with his military alias. It's a great symbol of historic pride for the local Poles and a source of awareness for locals that such an outstanding and unconventional character was born there and lived among them. We traveled to Kiverci in December during the biggest snowfall. When we finally got there, the bust arrived in perfect condition. The exhibition was opened in December of 2022 in one of the most difficult moments for our country. During preparations for this event, a bomb alert was sound, which slightly delayed the opening. However, with great joy, we noticed that despite that threat, many people came to that event. The meeting of Poles and Ukrainians. It was also an opportunity to share the Christmas wafer and sing carols together. It was a showcase of Polish spirit in those terrains. We talked about Edmund Malinowski's life story. We handed everybody a publication and uncovered the bust. Also, we presented the exhibition. It's very symbolic that in the moment when we announce that the exhibition title is When the heart beats louder than bombs, our hearts really were beating louder than the bomb alarms outside. The whole event had a very important symbolic aspect to it because of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Today, Edmund Malinowski is of great importance to the Kivertsi community, being an inspiring case of heroism in the face of harsh realities of war. This symbolic realm gives the community of Kivertsi a conviction that their own actions are key to achieve victory in today's conflict. The memory of our hero is still alive in the local community, thanks to the initiatives taken by the members of the Sacred Heart of Jesus Christ Parish in Kiverci, as well as the Ewa Felinska's Polish Culture Association. Edmund Malinowski combines many qualities of a community worker, a fighter, a hero, a teacher. Pavel will tell us all about it. The book title When the Heart Beats Louder Than Bombs is not coincidental. The fact that those people did not hear bomb explosions showcases their character and courage that much more. In 2023, an identical exhibition with the same bust as in Kivertsi was prepared. They were given to the school taking care of Edmund's gravesite. The exhibition is there to this day. We are standing in front of Lakert family mansion in Chehanki. We're having an open-air workshop of my ceramics studio. I came here along with a couple of my students for the firing of Edmund Malinowski's bust. The creation process was classical and started with a sketch drawing, which was an object of earlier consultation, then a scale of the sculpture was determined. It was sculpted in a 70-simeter scale 
and I sculpted it classically from clay. Then I created a mold and made a, a ceramic clay imprint. Following that, it had to dry out. Later on, it underwent a bisque fire procedure. And now we will perform a second firing. This so-called Hungarian kiln is made of fire clay brick, is filled with coke. An interesting fact about that kiln is that it's burning from the top down. From the evening and throughout the night when it's dark, it glows beautifully. You will see that on the footage, how the spaces between the bricks that allow the air to pass through cause the gust of wind to fuel the fire in the coke and later glow. The entire kiln reaches the temperature from 1200 degrees Celsius, even up to 1300 degrees. And at night, the glow is spectacular and resembles a Christmas tree. As I mentioned, the kiln has a conic structure, is made of bricks and is movable so when the firing concludes, or when the coke has burned through, or the clay has been treated, the kiln then is taken apart, with the bricks still usable for the construction of another kiln. In the current year, we expanded the Edmund Malinowski exhibition with expositions devoted to current volunteers and events of the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war. Many visiting guests specifically noticed the Malinowski exhibition and often would ask questions about how those topically different fields are connected. While answering, we emphasized the great importance of this example. It represents a unique symbol of common people heroism. When an individual person chooses common good over their own safety, life, and either economic or political interest. This leads us to reflect on the meaning behind the concept of public service and social commitment in times of a military crisis such as the present one. It is important to understand that victory is not the result of political action, but the result of sacrifice and determination effort of common people who choose public interest and the good of the state and nation over the personal gain. Such attitude and the example of Edmund Malinowski remains as relevant and inspiring for both the local community and people visiting our museum. Family atmosphere associated with traditions, history and respect for the community provides the foundation on which strong patriotic ties are built. It is in the family that fundamental values are instilled, which later influence civic attitudes and involvement in social life, by creating a solid bedrock for the emergence of patriotism. All of the children from House Malinowski took part in the fighting for freedom and independence of Poland. Both the father and the mother instilled their children with unwavering qualities. They gave them the feeling of Polish awareness, despite adverse times where schools only taught in Russian language. Neither teaching Polish nor cultivating the tradition were welcomed or safe to do. Stanislav was a participant in Polish-Soviet war. Earlier, he was involved in independence efforts by serving in Pilsudski's legions. In the interwar period, he worked as a driver. According to family records, Edmund's brother was a personal driver of the owner of a famous confectionery firm, V. Deal. Piotr Malinowski, already as an 18-year-old, voluntarily enrolled to Navy. During World War II, he became a Marine aboard vessel named Narvik, the famous one, which was gifted to the Polish army in 1942. Marian Malinowski was the third of Edmund's brothers. He was involved in conspiration activities by serving in the home army. He also participated in the Warsaw Uprising. Edmund's sister, Vatswawa, also left Volhynia pretty early and worked as a stewardess on merchant and passenger ships. After the breakout of World War II, she assumed a position in Gdynia shipyard. At the time, there operated a rescue unit saving shot down Allied pilots. That unit would send saved pilots to Sweden using regular ships. 
Václava would take part in such rescue efforts. During one of the failed actions, she was arrested and sent to Stutthof German concentration camp. The example of Edmund and his loved ones shows us that even in moments of doubt, one should not lose faith in the in victory and not to give up the struggle against one's weaknesses or adversities. Edmund was remembered by his family as a modest and good-natured man, fully aware of what really mattered in life. He is an example of the model of all virtues, because throughout his life he constantly nurtured his love for his fatherland. There is a wise saying that no one is born a hero. This is true because becoming a hero is a tremendous feat. By being such an extraordinary man, Edmund Malinowski definitely deserves being called a hero.